recording has started okay so welcome to everybody this is the third series the third installation of um, the international legume society webinars and uh, we are happy to have all the people connected here live already and uh, also welcome uh, who is uh, watching our videos later in the future from our youtube channel or our website this is the third installation. We have already uh, most of the webinars for this year planned. Uh, there will be a healthy amount, a uh, good amount of talking about uh, plant disease, root rot and stuff like that. But for today, we're going to start uh, with a more uh, general point of view. We have here Professor uh, Eric von Wettberg from University of uh, Vermont. Uh, he mainly has focused uh, on uh, selection bottlenecks and the effect of domic domestication and breeding on uh, plant genetics and populations. And today we are going to talk about the Vevilonian series. So thanks, uh, thanks, Professor. Thanks to be here, and I leave uh, the microphone to you. Thank you, Nelson. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure to talk with all of you. Uh, I'm very fond of this series. I've enjoyed the uh, last two series. Uh, thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> In addition to being a professor, I'm currently the director of Vermont's Agricultural Experiment Station. That's an administrative assignment that takes up 50% of my time. Uh, so it's nice to have a break from uh, dealing with farms that have um, flooding on them or uh, manure pits that are no longer working, which is increasingly a large part of my administrative assignment or the staff complaining. Um, I'm going to give a talk that um, I've been thinking about for years. I'll uh, thank in a moment many of the people with whom I've had the, the great pleasure of working and have uh, helped in thinking about this. This is very much in progress. I am in the middle of writing a grant proposal about this that may or may not get done sometime soon uh, since it's a rolling deadline. Uh, I realize the risks of somebody seeing this, and I actually kind of hope that happens in that as an administrator, I'd rather see somebody do work in this vein um, than not. So I, bear with me. Let's make sure I'm using Teams correctly. All right. <clears throat> I think it's important to start with the most important thing. Uh, the kind of science that many of us do can't be done in person. So I'd like to make sure before I move on that I thank many of the people that I work with. I'm mostly going to talk about the work my lab and collaborators have been doing in the genus Vigna, which I think is perfect for looking at the idea of a Vavilovian series or a homologous series. Across several projects, I have a number of collaborators. I'm in particular going to talk about work that uh, Cheng Ri Li at National Taiwan University has led uh, over in Taipei. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Cheng Ri. We were part of a project that uh, was funded by the Russian and Taiwanese uh, science foundations before the war in Ukraine began when we could do this. I'll talk about work um, that Cheng Ri student Pa Wen led as part of a grant with Chow T. Ting, Roland uh, Schneifelfleitner, uh, and Maria Samsonova, as well as the curators at the Vavilov Institute, uh, Margarita Vishnikova and Marina Burleva. Uh, I'll be talking about some other Vigna work as well, and I'll uh, call out many of these particular collaborators as we go along. Many of the ideas, however, in this come from long running conversations with Peter Smickle. It's good to see you on this call, Peter and Ken Naito in Japan. I'll also talk about, just in passing, some work we did in the past in Chickpea, uh, a project that I think for most people is the Doug Cook Chickpea project, um, but involved hundreds of people in 26 countries uh, contributing to the use of wild relatives of chickpea. 
And as a counterpoint, I'll talk about some of our work in Lentil as well. Uh, that's out of a collaboration in Kirsten Betts Group. It's great to see some folks from Saskatoon here. Hi, Tom. Um, I'll particularly talk about work that Azalea Guerra Garcia did while she was a postdoc. She's now a faculty member uh, down in her native Mexico, uh, and Peter contributed to some of this work. So thank you, everyone. Uh, and my own group, um, we're interested in diversifying agricultural systems. The thing that scares me most is climate change, although I would put a close second, a second term of Donald Trump, and I don't mind that that's being recorded. Uh, I'm very concerned about uh, climate change, uh, and actually those two concerns are interrelated. So we have tried to develop a program that responds to this, but also grows out of our curiosity about how agriculture began. Although uh, my university hired me to teach crop breeding, I am actually an evolutionary biologist. And the most interesting evolution to me is, is the beginning of agriculture. So we've been working in three areas that I think thread the needle of being useful but also answering our interests are following our passions. We do work, we're doing some work at the moment with the Crop Trust, and we also are working with local groups. Our aim in these projects, although we don't have a university gene bank, besides two freezers in my lab, we try to work with groups whose genetic diversity is not well represented in gene banks, and I'll talk about this in a moment. Um, and we're, um, um, doing some consulting around uh, activities, the Crop Trust, which their amazing, bold project is pushing much of this forward. Climate change certainly scares us, but I have the good fortune of living in Vermont. For those of you who are not familiar with the geography of the northeastern part of North America, we're about 150 kilometers from Montreal. Vermont is one of two states in the U.S. that has a French state name. And uh, before uh, what we call the French and Indian War in the 1760s, Vermont was part of New France and Quebec. And we still have very close ties to them. And we have a climate pretty similar to Quebec's. So another role of our lab is improving crop rotations. And we think we can do this simply by being uh, advocates for legumes. <clears throat> Today's focus is this crop, however, uh, mung beans. Mung beans, vigna, uh, scientifically vigna radiata, are not a common crop in North America. They are very common across much of Asia, however, and have uh, moved into parts of East Africa and cuisines elsewhere. For much of the global north, Mung beans are most recognizable as sprouts. So if you go to a Chinese or a Vietnamese or a Thai restaurant, those fleshy looking sprouts uh, in the upper left of this picture with a lime wedge for scale are how we most frequently eat mung beans. They can be turned into a soup in East Asian thinking this soup is cooling. They can also be used, and their most frequent use is as dal. Uh, so South India and Myanmar produce about 60 to close to 70 percent of the world's mung beans. Thailand is third and ex is is one of the leading exporters uh, because of the orientation of their production. In those places, mung beans are often split or polished and used as dal. Like lentils, uh, they have the capacity of being cooked very quickly. If you want to start from a dry pulse, you can get to a perfectly edible dinner without needing to use a pressure cooker. The final traditional use, most popular in East Asia, this is particular po particularly popular in Japan, the Korea, and uh, Northern China, is to ground grind the chickpea into a flour and use it to make sweets. To my North American palate, it's not particularly sweet. It is not like eating Ben and Jerry's, the ice cream for which Vermont is famous, but it is sweet enough that it gives you the sensation of dessert. Uh, so dishes like mooncakes um, or this pastry from Fukuoka, Japan, will have mung bean flour in it. For those of us in the global north who struggle with consuming too many calories and a diet of mostly refined starches and meat, 
Mung bean is perfect in this setting because it has complex carbohydrates and a lot of protein. We digest it slowly, and it is one of the solution to the plague of the Western diet. Finally, mung beans uh, are favored by many in the plant protein industry. Peas are fantastic. Beans are common beans are fantastic, but both of them have a much beanier flavor than mung beans do. So in many applications where somebody does not want the flavor of peas, mung beans are a better alternative. They do have a high protein content, uh, frequently around 30%. They have round seeds and uh, it's easier to remove uh, off taste from them. If you polish off the green seed coat, usually you get a yellow inside that looks like eggs. And the largest um, company in this space is Just Foods. They do have North American offerings, but they're really focused on making plant-based eggs for South Asia. <clears throat> so we've, we started in Mung Bean uh, looking at gene bank collections. The largest gene bank collection is uh, based in Taiwan at the World Vegetable Center. Australia has a very large collection as well. And the Russian collection is, is not as large as the US collection, but well represents Central Asia. In using DART-seq to characterize this collection, uh, Cheng Ri led a group that included Roland, uh, Maria Samsonova in St. Petersburg, Sergei Nushtin and others. And in using the dart seek, it's clear that mung bean is most diverse and consistent with its archaeological record was domesticated in South Asia on this figure that is SA. It then moved to Southeast Asia uh, into cool, into wetter and still humid climates, was then brought up into East Asia, uh, probably starting maybe three, four thousand years ago with an initial domestication five-ish thousand years ago in South Asia. In East Asia, it moved over the land-based part of the Silk Road into Central Asia. So although Central Asia is geographically closer to South Asia, analysis of the material suggests that it moved into Central Asia over the Silk Road instead, which uh, because East Asia is cooler, is actually a, a shorter, climatic transition. In the right part of this figure, you can see our estimated effective population size in the past. And mung bean, like all annual pulses, uh, grain legumes, went through a bit of a bottleneck. But the South Asian material is actually pretty diverse. Um, there are stronger bottlenecks into mo in moving into the cooler, drier climates of East Asia and Central Asia. Uh, with a more recent expansion of that material, um, probably reflecting 20th century selection. In North America, mung bean is a very minor crop. Uh, there is a company in Boston, about 300 kilometers from where I'm sitting right now, that imports about a million tons of mung beans. Uh, yeah. I think it's a million tons uh, of mung beans into the U.S. each year for sprouts. They're one of the larger sprouts companies in the U.S. They import only organic Chinese uh, sprouts. There is a market in the U.S. Uh, about 20 years ago, there was an active breeding program in Oklahoma. Uh, but by and large, mung bean is a, a very minor crop. But it is favored by... Um, Consumers in diaspora communities, and I, I tend to use this, be careful with my phrasing, uh, for whom it is culturally significant. Um, so we've begun working with the Ujama Cooperative Farming Alliance, as well as the Organic Seed Alliance uh, to work on breeding this. I happen to be wearing Ujama's shirt right now. Uh, this is a call out to uh, my friends in Ujama. They are a cooperative uh, farming association, uh, and we've begun um, participatory breeding of sorghum, uh, which is also culturally significant in many of their um, African diaspora communities, and mung bean in, in more of their Asian communities. And we're using a participatory breeding approach, uh, similar to ones that have been used in Ethiopia or other parts of the global south, 
with a tri-coat design uh, where we've got three uh, lines. Two of them are existing releases from the Oklahoma State program. And then a third line is a testing variety. And by having each farmer rank their varieties, the three that they've received, we can line up their opinions about their varieties to start to make assessments. Part of the reason we're using this design is that mung bean has very distinct uses. Although for most Americans it sprouts, uh, the North America has large and diverse communities uh, that have cultural ties to South Asia. And in those communities, the doll uses uh, for curries are much more significant. And a, a different bean is preferred with a smaller seed size uh, and maybe a different flavor. Uh, some of South Asian varieties have a mutation that gives them the same buttery or pandan smell that characterizes jasmine and basmati rice. So our, our participatory trials, we're also backing them up at my university. We can see that some of the diverse material we're using has lots of problems. Uh, we'll talk more about diseases in this series, but yellow mosaic virus is a major problem of mung bean. And although we have not produced it in this uh, plot before, we have lots of it on many of these varieties. Um, we also see lots of variation in things like leaf shape. We're particularly interested in the orientation of pods. Uh, mung bean is traditionally hand harvested in much of India. Uh, but increasingly in India, as well as the U.S., mechanical harvest is essential. And I don't have a good image of this because we're just about to harvest the plants. But having the pods up at the top uh, arranged above the vegetation makes it much easier to harvest this. And this is going to be a breeding target, even for our BIPOC producers, uh, who will need mechanical harvests as they grow in scale. Mung bean fascinates me, but what part of uh, the draw of it is that it's in a genus that has nine domestication events. And in the Asian part of uh, the genus Vigna, it's a large tropical genus that is a history of taxonomic revisions. Uh, there are a number of other regionally important crops. Mung bean is the, the only Asian Vigna that has much international trade. Edzuki bean is behind it. There is some North American production in Ontario, in Michigan. I believe Valerio uh, Hoya Vallega on this call uh, may uh, eventually, as his bean program expands in scope and ambition, uh, consider this one of his targets. In other parts of Asia, um, other vignas, Erd bean in India, Creole bean in Southeast Asia, and not featured on this slide, uh, Muth bean in India, all have uh, regional markets. They're significant. This forms some form of series. And kicking around in our literature on domestication is the work of this man. I'm going to transition a little bit away from mung bean to the, uh, our, some of our thinking about domestication. Vavilov is perhaps the greatest plant collector. Uh, the Russian accessions of Vigna that um, Cheng Ri and others' work sequenced uh, included his collections. He did more collecting than perhaps any individual before he perished in the Gulag during the Second World War. Uh, and he managed to collect on all five continents in 64 countries. Since I'm linguistically useless, I'm always impressed with how many languages he spoke. His collection remains. Uh, it's still housed on a central square in what's now St. Petersburg. Uh, and he drew heavily from ideas of gene banks that were developing in the US and in Germany uh, at the time. Uh, and his training of his staff was uh, incredible. His legume collections uh, have been outpaced by legume collections built elsewhere in the later 20th century. But as historical collections, uh, his, his collections are amazing resources. Uh, some of the work that we did before the war in Ukraine made it impossible was characterizing how mung beans that went into the Vavilov collection at different times over the last century varied in size showing that breeders have actively selected larger seed, medium and larger seeds in mung bean 
and uh, medium duration uh, phenologies. The Avaloth is frequently attributed with two ideas, and you'll hear others in this series sometimes talk about it. One of these is that many crops have a few centers of origin, uh, whether they are, arise from a single domestication event like chickpea, which I'll talk about briefly later in this talk, or common bean, which famously has both an Andean and Mesoamerican domestication. The intensity of that centrality may vary, but there's still usually a place where people began growing a crop. The second observation is made is that crop species have similarities. We now call these, following the work of Hamner, uh, domestication syndromes. But in many groups, cereals and legumes in particular, these form a series. So if we look at the areas that Vivila have identified as centers of origins of crops, like the, the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East, uh, Mesoamerica, the Andean Highlands, these are areas where no, a, a large number of crops originate. And in many of these places, there are parallel series of crops that look quite similar. So among our beloved legumes, we have common beans, as well as other phaseola species from the Americas, as well as ground nuts, or uh, to North Americans like me, peanuts. We have our cool season legumes from the Fertile Crescent, chickpea, lentil, peas, fava beans. We have a number of African domesticates. Uh, we have important crops like soybean from East Asia. And then South Asia is a particularly important realm for legume domestication because a, a continent that now has a billion vegetarians has likely domesticated more legumes than anywhere else. Pigeon pea, uh, horse gram, lab lab uh, are some of them, but a number of species in the genus Vigna, like mung bean, erd bean, and moth bean, are also um, critical domesticates uh, in South Asia. All of these legumes have the similarities of um, mostly being non-shattering, mostly having immediate germination, larger seed size compared to their wild relatives, reduced levels of defensive chemistry. All right. So in case you're wondering what I'm trying to talk about in this talk, um, what is a homologous series? Well, theoretically, the groups of legumes that I just showed are homologous series. But another way of looking at this is thinking about how homologous series are defined in other fields. Chemistry most often uses this term. Uh, and in chemistry, a homologous series is a group of molecules that share a functional group, an alcohol, an alkene, or something else on them. And this gives them similar properties. So in something like drug development, having that similar property may mean that two compounds that are different, maybe have different membrane per permeabilities, can still target the same enzyme. I think this is a reasonable starting point for uh, what it might mean in legumes or in domestication. Um, but part of the reason to give this talk is, is perhaps to revisit this term and have um, uh, someone uh, flame me for uh, perhaps a better definition. So a shared domestication syndrome uh, could be part of a homologous series. And we certainly observe this in legumes loss of shattering of pods, uh, immediate or nearly immediate germination when seeds are planted. Shared domestication loci is a possibility. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've thought about this in terms of pod shattering, and there are distinct similarities in some of the loci that are involved. But in addition, many legumes solve uh, or shattering is, has been solved with different loci in different plants that all give um, that shared appearance. In improvement traits, uh, it's not necessarily a domestication syndrome, but an improvement syndrome, there's also shared genes involved in things like the stay green trait, which we can find in uh, peas, chickpeas, soybeans, uh, common beans, lentils. Another possibility is that there are shared population genetic processes. Genetic bottlenecks are ubiquitous. 
uh, are nearly ubiquitous in domestication events. Um, trees and some vegetables may not have them, but most grain crops do have pop, um, strong bottlenecks. So these could be a similarity, although how we define that uh, may have devils in the details. Another possibility is that they have shared ecological function, that a legume in an agricultural system uh, pro provides the same role, sort of irrespective of what its uh, species is. So whether we, if we're in Saskatchewan and our farmers mostly grow wheat, it may not really matter whether they're growing peas, fava beans, lentils, or chickpeas. And I don't mean to offend Tom or anyone else who may favor a particular legume on this call, but from the farmer's perspective, as long as they all provide nitrogen, and as long as they don't share diseases, and in fact, lentil and peas do share diseases in this in the system I'm mentioning, um, they are more or less functionally equivalent. As legumes, the nitrogen is almost certainly critical, um, but the shared or similar microbial communities may be important as well. So there's a growing body of work uh, that I'm not going to uh, dwell on, but Ruben Milla in Spain and others have done fascinating work showing that there's shared components of sort of a core microbial community. Uh, and legumes in a rotation, um, as long as they're somewhat ecologically similar, may actually um, provide some of that sort of shared nitrogen processing or other things in soil communities. So I'm going to take a moment to look at this in uh, the genus Vigna. If we start from the bottom left of this figure around 2a, we see Bambara. This is an African uh, Vigna species. It is consumed like groundnuts or peanuts. It has a high oil content. And like groundnuts, it has a geocarpic fruit that buries itself. And in many ways, when the Portuguese introduced groundnuts to Africa, they replaced Bambara. Cowpea is the most important of the Vigna crops with global distribution, production on all five, con uh, I believe all six continents. Um, then we get to zombie pea. This is a poorly known uh, tuber forming legume. It's likely actually a complex of species because some people think it was domesticated in both Sudan and Bali, Indonesia. It, the seeds are perfectly edible, but it's frequently consumed for its uh, tubers. As a zombie, it's called zombie pea because it can be difficult to kill and survive droughts. In Asia, we have muth beans, which is a very uh, dry uh, region uh, bean. Erd beans, uh, which are relatively close to mung beans, uh, can be an important source of resistance genes for mung beans don't have much of an international market. They're also sometimes called black lentils. Edzuki beans are the most cold tolerant of this group. Chengri and Ken Naito have uh, nailed down a Japanese domestication for it. Uh, and it's an important crop uh, in uh, much of East Asia. Creole beans uh, have a much smaller market as well as rice beans, which are not um, both hidden under um, Nelson on my image, uh, both important in Southeast Asia, uh, not widely distributed outside of the region. And then mung bean uh, following cow pea is the second most important crop of this group. In South Asia, it's sometimes referred to as green gram as it has the distinctly green, uh, the distinctly green seed coat. Within the Asian part of this group, many of these species are closely related. There are strong species barriers in this group, uh, so it's possible to make some crosses with embryo rescue mung bean, Vigna radiata, can be crossed to erd bean, uh, which has the poor choice of a scientific name of Vigna mungo. Uh, some other crosses are possible. All of these species are diploids with 500 to 600 megabase genomes, with the exception of Vigna reflexopelosa, which is a, poly, a tetraploid. Um, the Himalayas form a strong barrier. Uh, so Vigna angularis and umbilata and pelosa are all on the north side of uh, the Himalayas, and that in part divides this phylogeny. 
All right, so if we look at these, I've tried to make the case in talking through these species that they're a bit of an ecological series. Mung bean is the most widespread. Edzuki bean is a cold tolerant version. Vigna mungo or erd bean is a clay soil specialist. Uh, not featured here, muth bean goes into drier areas. And I suspect, but I haven't put a slide for this up because I'm not even sure how to prove this, that in South Asia, as farmers moved south from the Indus Valley and took a grain-based system focused on rice and wheat in the um, early Harappan civilization about 6,000 years ago, as they moved towards Bhopal, the chickpea, lentil, and peas that they were growing fared poorly. They found that mung bean did better. They domesticated it. And then as that agricultural system moved through more of South Asia into Southeast Asia, uh, all of these other legumes were domesticated. Edzuki bean may very well be um, independent, um, but it's also grown in parts of Japan where uh, soybeans fare poorly. And likely early Japanese farmers grew edzuki bean when they could not grow soybean. So I have a few predictions. Um, I appreciate your tolerance of a talk with relatively little data and a not yet perfectly articulated idea. I predict that in Vigna there are shared population genetic processes, but that the older crops, mung bean, have a stronger bottleneck than the other ones. We don't yet have enough sequenced material uh, from the minor Vigna species, rice bean, uh, creole bean, to really estimate the bottlenecks properly. Um, but I, I hope to garner resources and work with others to do this. I suspect that in each of these uh, taxa, there are domes different domestication loci, but shared syndromes. There's only so many ways to keep a pod from shattering, but likely a different mutation is selected in each one. Similarly, to get in, uh, immediate to lose seed dormancy, uh, possibly different mutations are involved. And I think there's likely to be very different climatic tolerances in this group. My argument for why there are so many domesticated vignas is that no one vigna crop is suitable in all places. Uh, so consequently, different species would need different tolerances. To look at this, however, we really need a genus-wide pangenome. Um, each of these crops has an existing draft genome. Many of them are pretty drafty, uh, which is no, um, I'm not casting shade on those who have done the work, but we need more resources to improve the quality of these genomes and put them all together so that when we find domestication loci, we can compare them and so that we can look at both fixed variation within species that differs between them, but also variation within species that really ask questions about the similarity of climatic tolerances. And to emphasize this point, I want to go back to some of the work that Pawan Ong Cheng Ri uh, did with, uh, with uh, us. In Mung Bean, um, we see its movement across Asia along a path of climatic least resistance. So Mung Bean went from South Asia that's pretty hot uh, as, as a general characterization into Southeast Asia, which is also warm, tropical, but even in many places more humid. Much of India is obviously a very a strenuous desert. From tropical, humid Southeast Asia, Mung Bean moved into humid East Asia uh, with increasing levels of cold tolerance. And then it moved across uh, Asia into Central Asia. So this is a, a path of climatic least resistance. Uh, our analysis of a niche, a, species distribution models or ecological niche models supports this. But I suspect as we move out to the whole genus with a pan genome, we would find different loci involved uh, and perhaps different types of jumps. Although I still think sort of movement across climatic space is something that takes uh, strong selective pressures and, and likely more genetic changes. All right, so um, this is 
I'm going to skip back over this. Nelson, how am I doing for time? You are doing super OK, so okay. don't worry and uh, talk as, as long as you want. I'll, I'll take a few more minutes. So I'm still thinking. I think it's clear. I'm still thinking, but uh, I'm admittedly at the proposal generation stage and thinking about the genus Vigna. In the Asian Vignas, they have differing domestication times and places, many in South Asia, some in East Asia, some in Southeast Asia. And I think there's similarities among them. I think there's shared cultural knowledge of them. There's another series of domesticated legumes that I have thought about, and I'm going to shift geographies because the domestications in the Fertile Crescent are older instead of being 5,000 to 3,000 years old, uh, they're more on the range of 10 to 12,000 years old. And the domestication of peas, lentils, and chickpeas, and likely fava beans, uh, instead of being ecologically disparate, are likely ecologically similar, and more or less all at the same time. So I think this gives us a different set of hypotheses. And I have worked for a greater amount of time in this group, so it'll be nice to have something with a little bit more data behind it. So um, with help in, in a running collaboration with Peter Smickle, hi, Peter, um, who I had the great fortune of hosting as a sabbatical scholar here in Vermont, we looked at the distribution of the wild relatives of chickpea, lentil, and peas. And this is Peter's... Uh, uh, graphing of them, you can see that Sicer chickpeas have the narrowest distribution. They also have the least genetic variation consistent with this. Uh, my ex part of my explanation for this is that chickpeas, unlike lentils and peas, are actually in a African clade uh, of plants. It's still a cool season legume, but it has a rand flora distribution. So as Africa has gotten hotter and drier over the last five to 15 million years as uh, Antarctica moved to the South Pole and made the world cooler and drier over the last 15 million years. As that happened, and as the Isthmus of Panama closed off uh, tropical ocean circulation, those two things led to Africa becoming drier, and that pushed taxa like Sicer to the edges of it. So Sicer can be found in the Canary Islands, the Atlas Mountains of Morocco, in the Ethiopian Highlands, but most of its distribution is in um, Turkey, um, Anatolia, and then into Central Asia, where it's been pushed into what are now cooler montane conditions there. And that just gives the whole group a, a narrow distribution. Lentil and peas, uh, you know, both of them really should probably be in the genus Vicia. And that whole group has a more uh, temperate, distrib temperate to Mediterranean distribution. And I think the immediate wild relatives have a broader distribution in part because of that. So um, in comparing these three groups, I've already talked through some of the phylogenetic considerations. In chickpea, we've spent a portion of the last decade trying to expand the diversity by uh, more thoroughly collecting wild relatives. Uh, before we began working in this, there were only 18 accessions of chickpeas' immediate wild relative in international gene banks, uh, at least if you track down the passport data and showed that with duplicate entries, um, uh, many of the entries were, were not uh, independent. And uh, most of these came from just a handful of villages. So in the, the project that um, many identify as uh, with its uh, primary PI, Doug Cook, but involved um, over 100 other people, including amazing uh, group leaders in Turkey, Abdullah Karaman, uh, Bikir Bakun, and a lot of work um, with funding from Australia from Jens Berger. Uh, we were, and uh, Cengiz Toker in Turkey, we were able to collect in 2013 and to a lesser extent in 2014 and 15 in Southeast Turkey and increased by one to two orders of magnitude uh, the size of collections. 
showing substantial diversity in southeastern Turkey. Doug and others uh, in the breeding programs in Saskatoon, in particularly in Australia, um, at, at CSIRO and in Judith's lab uh, in Australia. Uh, there's ongoing work to harness this diversity. Uh, Doug Cook has rolled up a new company that has a number of releases on the marketplace as well. Other legumes from this region have similar patterns of genetic diversity, although the actual population genetics of this are, are different in different species. So in work in which I had no involvement, Peter has shown patterns of diversity in, in wild peas, for example, uh, showing its wide distribution across the Mediterranean. In lentil with an intermediate distribution as part of Azalea's postdoc with Kirsten and partially with me, um, we were able to use uh, GBS sequencing to characterize diversity and um, uh, this paper is now out, uh, but it uh, was was complicated to publish in part because we basically found no geographic pattern whatsoever to uh, the patterns of differentiation uh, in lens orientalis, uh, which likely suggests that it's weedy and has moved around with land use modification over the last 10,000 years, mixing up populations in the Fertile Crescent. Fava beans should be part of this. The oldest archaeological remain of chickpea that's clearly domesticated is from a site in northern Syria, where there are also fava beans that are clearly domesticated as well. They're of a large size, both are charred, um, suggesting they've been cooked. Both have hillums that look like um, cultivated forms. Nonetheless, we don't have a compatible wild relative of fava bean, unless one has emerged recently. We do finally have a fava bean genome, which is a, a major advance. Um, and it would be nice to be able to compare patterns of fava bean wild relatives like Vichia narbonensis, um, although the situation in the Fertile Crescent continues to make this difficult. Nonetheless, we've, and this is really uh, coming from Peter, look to see if there's shared domestication loci. Peter had collected data um, that allowed him to QTL map uh, loci for uh, dormancy in uh, peas, uh, as well as shattering. We know the loci for sh shattering in chickpea, and Kirsten has recently published it for lentil. Um, if we look at seed dormancy and line up the homologous chromosomes of peas, lentils, and chickpeas, by and large, there's not overlap. There's maybe one or two loci that could be shared, um, but likely not. We have a manuscript in revision uh, where we've looked closely at this with lentil. Um, we've characterized a uh, real population of lentil that Kirsten's team has developed for both seed coat thickness, SCT on this graph. You can see the, two, the wild and the cultivated parent. Um, the cultivated parent in pink has a uh, lesser seed coat thickness, while in magenta or bluish, um, the wild parent has a thicker seed coat thickness. We've also looked at percent imbibed uh, seeds. This uh, is a better measure of how much water they actually take up as they're germinating. Uh, and you can see that the uh, cultivated parent takes up more. We've a QTL mapped loci for this. And then I'm not showing the data. We've used RNA-seq to try to narrow this. The takeaway, looks like um, similar mechanisms, but not necessarily the same genes as uh, peas. This makes sense. There are a number of loci that could impact how polyphenols are oxidized. Uh, plants have a number of polyphenol oxidases. Um, so even if that class of genes are target, different modifications could get there. There's also probably many ways to weaken a seed coat, uh, particularly around the hill. All right, so there are a number of open questions here. Are the same genes selected in independent domestications? No, probably not, but the mechanisms are almost certainly similar. 
this makes sense as a domestication syndrome, I, I think. Um, is the reduction in effective population size similar? Uh, yes, but even in a place where, in a example where there are three domestications at more or less the same time, every species is different. They're sort of like Tolstoy's marriages and each one is um, a total disaster in its own way. Is spatial variation similar in these groups? No, not really. And I think that's in part because wild sicer just has a really narrow distribution and lentil in its wild form is pretty weedy. Um, do, should we expect similarities? Uh, well, as I've tried to note, chickpea is really, is in a rather different clade. Um, yes, it's a cool season legume, uh, but I think its biology is just different. In fava bean, we don't know. I have left grass pea out of uh, this comparison because its domestication was later and in the Balkans, um, but likely things are similar about its uh, domestication syndrome and its evolutionary past. Um, and what makes all of this work hard is that the whole Vicia lathris pisum lens clade has so many transposable elements that I think they, I think, well, they just make all of the genomes uh, a bit of a hassle to work with. All right. I'm going to wrap up here to hopefully stimulate discussion. I'd like to thank an amazing set of collaborators again. I have not mentioned everyone, but it's a pleasure to work with dozens of amazing researchers. Um, I haven't talked much about the work of Artie Singh or Matthew Blair who have burgeoning uh, mung bean breeding programs, uh, our chickpea team, and I've uh, relied have, heavily on and always enjoy collaborating with Peter, Kirsten, and Azalea. So with that, I'll uh, say thank you again, Tuzan Tuck, uh, Spasiba, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. It was... Uh very interesting uh, presentation many people are clapping and uh, expressing the cheer i also have already a question from the chat i will read it for everybody thanks eric obviously so do you think that subpopulations undergoing differentiation until eventually yeah. forming a new species and this process continuing until reproductive barriers are formed would each of these linking subpopulation constitute a homologous series too? So this is a definition. It, it, it is a good definition question. And I, I don't know if, uh, thank you, Valerio. Um, it's particularly a good question coming from uh, a, a common bean breeder and biologist. And I think common bean really forces this question on us. Um, so definitions matter. Uh, in trying to prepare for this, I I may not have had enough time to look deeply for a good, uh, for a paper that I've missed. This is one of the things about a time when there's so many papers. Um, I think it would. I, I think in common being the Mesoamerican and Andean gene pools constitute that. One of the questions, and this, this is similar to what we know about rice. There's been bitter debate between different researchers as to whether there's one, two, or overlapping sort of half domestications in rice. One story, I, I think the data is most consistent with this, but sometimes further analysis or different analysis changes this, is that the first Ariza sativa japonica was domesticated first that was brought into South Asia, used a little bit, but poorly adapted. It then hybridized with an indica form in the wild state. And then the domestic, the shattering locus was selected on, but indica rice formed. So most of the genomes indica. Um, is that a homologous series or is that a, a, a shared locus? Well, it, it's complicated. I, I think what it says is selection was similar. 
ecology or sort of agroecology matters. And I think that in in Phaseolus vulgaris, the question is, and we may not have sufficient sampling to get at this because you need thousands of accessions to get this. The Andean gene pool is domesticated later. There were people moving up and down the Americas. Although the Andean gene pool is distinct ecologically and genetically, there is a strong barrier. Although, um, was there a little bit of movement? And it, are there loci that are shared um, that then spread into the background? I don't know. I still think thinking about it as a homologous series. Phaseolus is the other group we're asking homologous series makes sense. Out, you know, in temporary bean, it's clearly the drought adapted form. It has a scientific name that's similar to muth bean. Um, and they ecologically, they're kind of a parallel series. The same could be said for scarlet runner bean and year long bean. Um, uh, Coccinius and Dumosus. They're clearly more humid tolerant than vulgaris is. All right. Okay. I will uh, thank you for the answer. Uh, does Tom that raised uh, uh, his hand? Go for it, Tom. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Eric. Thanks a lot for a wonderful talk. Uh, a question that came to mind uh, when you were talking about the Vigna, and uh, I was wondering um, which which of those species do you think is the most uh, climate adapted or most widely climate adapted and and then maybe which might expand the most in the next uh, decade or so in terms of commercial production so um cowpea is the largest acreage in the whole group um it is remarkably drought adapted in the sahel of africa um and goes into pretty humid places mung bean i think in a sort of strictly niche modeling sense has somewhat more in that it will go into uh, increasingly dry areas. Um, and to get to Remy's question at the same time, uh, there is varying uh, day length responsiveness in both of those. Uh, it's not as strong as it is in something like pea or lentil, uh, where um, you know South Asian lentils are very distinct from Mediterranean lentils because of the day length responsiveness. Mung bean uh, generally has less of that. I think the we work on mung bean in part because we think they have the most potential to move, that um, climate change, particularly in North America, should create good mung bean conditions. The Oklahoma had the breeding program, but Minnesota is going to look an awful lot like Oklahoma soon. Um, and then, you know, you're going to be growing soybeans and <laughs> Minnesota is going to have, it's going to look like Texas. Um, that, uh, so I think that that's, I think mung bean, um, thank you. One. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. The questions were, well, you uh, already brushed uh, Remy's question about photo period. And I guess uh, you were already half answering to Luigi's question that is basically how this uh, understanding of the homologous series and the domestication process uh, can help guide yeah. current so breeding, modern <laughs> breeding, uh, in the, also in the um, uh, in the light of climate change and uh, the need for climate resilient uh, re crops. So I, I didn't frame the talk this way, but uh, I think part of what it does is if we if I go back to the example of Saskatchewan and, and Tom, uh, part of the success of the breeding program in Saskatchewan is that they've generated high latitude, hot summer, cold winter adapted Mediterranean crops to that system. And it's not that they just have peas, peas are great, but the productivity of legumes in that we sometimes occasionally canola, uh, usually a legume rotation in Saskatchewan uh, is built on being able to alternate peas, chickpeas, fava beans and lentils and having all four of them makes the system more stable it does reduce all of the disease pressure 
Um, so part of what a homologa understanding homologous series gives us the potential to do is have legumes catch up with have secondary legume crops catch up with the with the most productive ones. So if we go south of the border from Canada to the US, um, the dominant rotation in North America is in the, because the U US has greater agricultural area, even if Canada's a whole lot bigger, it's maize and soybean. And that's pushing into Canada increasingly. Maize and soybean are more productive than any other cropping system in that setting. Uh, but the disease and pest pressure that they get is immense. The single most beneficial thing you could do for the ecological catastrophe that that system is, is lengthen it. Winter wheat is already a good option. It's profitable. Vladimir Putin has done a great job of raising its price uh, for those who grow it uh, in, in North America. Uh, so that that already works. But winter wheat is done uh, too early in this late enough in the season that you can't plant soybean after it. Uh, Mung bean fits perfectly into that system because it's shorter duration. And we think a four crop rotation is the biggest benefit there. So if we can use a homologous series to catch mung bean up because it is a minor crop, it doesn't have particularly high yields. It hasn't been bred for this system. This I haven't talked at length about this because RD Singh's program in Iowa where this is appropriate is really focused on this, but it would be a huge step forward uh, in reducing pesticide use, uh, increasing the efficiency of a system and protecting soil in North America. I think the same can be said for other systems. Having erd bean or muth bean catch up with mung bean mm. yields. I said they're not high, but they're still higher than muth bean or erd bean. Uh, that would be great in South Asia. Um, it also, if we want to neo-domesticate species, uh, it gives us a sense of what the lines of genetic least resistance are likely to be. If if multiple species have been domesticated by this route in this group, if you wanted to say domesticate Vigna stipulaceae, a semi-wild uh, species that can be harvested, you've got a sense from the other Vignas. Okay. Um, this also uh, links well to the, another question that we received. So uh, let's uh, con consider a little bit more, uh, a little bit more optimistic approach. Let's say that uh, with gene editing, we are aiming to re-domesticate or yep. uh, domesticate the semi-wild uh, species or re-domesticate. Could we yep. benefit uh, from what we learned about uh, this progression and maybe uh, trying to target a different loci yep. for the same effect? That's a, a great question, Luigi. And to get to the flowering time part of that, I, I, I mean, the um, what FTA, FT2AB complex, I, I'm probably misnaming it because I'm nervous on the spot. Um, it's a major locus in chickpea that confers uh, day length and sensitivity. There's a huge linkage block around it that's been dragged towards fixation. In the domestication of chickpea, day length sensitivity was a critical issue. Shahel Abo has been quite persuasive in showing that a shift from fall planting to spring planting was likely important in its uh, adoption, whether or not there really was a 2000 year gap in its production. Ascochyta blight is such a major challenge in chickpea. Like there are, there may be a little bit of stackable quantitative resistance in the wild material. There is some, um, but in many ways, cultivated chickpea already has more of it stacked into it. It's seasonal avoidance that's critical. But understanding that locus, and a, a shout out, he's not thinked on my slides, but Jim Weller in New Zealand, who, who's done fabulous work on that. There are similar things that happen in lentil. It's a key part of lentil being uh, something we can cultivate in Sri Lanka or Southern India as a, as a tropical plant that has, it, sorry, its wild material is very much Mediterranean temperate. Uh, day length sensitivity is definitely something that I, I think as breeders we should be thinking about. 
one way to increase climatic resistance is to generate material that flowers earlier. We have good examples from a range of legumes of, of loci that do this. Uh, the FT locus and chickpea is not the only one. Um, Bunyam in Tehran has done some, uh, among others, some great work on this. We know there's a trade-off uh, in early flowering and productivity, uh, but in many cases, the value of a legume uh, may still be high. And with climate change, some production is better than none. Um, so yeah, and I'm cert I am in a state uh, that is among the most liberal in the U.S. Uh, in my administrative role, I get three or four neighbors uh, sending emails every week about the use of Roundup uh, in a conventional crop rotation on our farm. Uh, there are undergraduate students who would be happy to throw a brick uh, through my lab window uh, if they heard we were doing gene editing, uh, just because. Um, just because the, the state of uh, concern about it is high, but these are effective tools and uh, taking them off the table just makes it harder to diversify agricultural systems. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that also moves pretty far away from our concern as a scientist and embrace uh, the society at large and yeah. a larger problems, larger topics. We still have questions. You are very popular today. Uh, so this new question is about uh, diversity to resilience in agroecology and food systems. Thank you, Keen. Uh, thank you for joining. I know it's uh, quite late in Vietnam right now. Um, so I, I think one of the, particularly in Vigna, which has wild relatives across um, an arc from South Asia, Southeast Asia, well into temperate East Asia, but also through Northern Australia. There are a number, uh, particularly among the wild relatives in, uh, in Northern Australia. That proximity to locally adapted, resilient wild relatives is a uh, uh, definitely a source of resilience in systems. So I will give another cat shout out to Ken Naito, uh, who is uh, doing some brilliant work across Vigna. Uh, he's, one of his projects has looked at Vigna marina, uh, salt tolerant coastal uh, Vigna species. And, you know, along the lines of Luigi's question, harnessing it to produce in increasingly saline coastal areas uh would be a step forward if we think about china it is the most important country in the world in, in terms of geopolitics and that's no uh, slight to india which has more people and is also central to the 21st century both of them have a lot of agricultural production on the coast in china it's particularly striking because the interior of china is uninhabitable mostly as desert and mountain as sea levels rise and you pack more people into the coastal plain of East Asia, that means production needs to continue in saline conditions. And, um, you know, just a little bit south in Hanoi, um, you will have a little bit of that, but salt tolerant mung bean or, or any Vigna um, would help keep those systems. The Chinese have made great progress in salt tolerant rice, um, but, we suffer when we live on rice alone. Yeah, sure. Yeah, golden rice can only do so much. Okay. Thing. Seems like uh, there's no more questions. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And uh, so we thank uh, all the attendants and all the people that will uh, watch our webinar online. I thanks again, you Eric, for your competence and your very interesting presentation for today. And uh, to everybody, goodbye. See you next time. Take Bye. care, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Bye, everyone.